Sometimes, if you want to find out what's really happening, you've got to get out there and look. I'm Emma Inch. I'm an award-winning drinks writer and former British Beer Writer of the Year. Back in March 2020, the world changed for everyone, and when the pandemic struck, the drinks industry was one of the sector's worst affected. After spending a few weeks following the unfolding crisis from the safety of my home, I decided I wanted to see for myself how drinks producers were managing at this incredibly difficult time. So I packed up my other home, my motor home, and I hit the road. And what I've found are stories of resilience, creativity, innovation, and ultimately, survival. Come and join me on my journey. The mouse that roared. That's how Shane Swindles, founder of Cheshire Brewhouse, described his brewery when we met. And he's right, this small brewery is punching above its weight. With a varied core cool range and some very impressive heritage brews, Shane has created a brewery that both talks the talk and walks the walk. Throughout 2020, Cheshire Brewhouse has seen its profile increase. Rolling out cans meant that more people got to hear about the work Shane was doing. And they got to hear about Shane himself. Raconteur, musician and mighty fine brewer. So, Shane, I mean, what's happened, really? Because you weren't on my radar, say, a year ago, maybe even six months ago. Um, Where have you come from? Well, we've been slugging away for eight years. Um, and we've had quite a bit of recognition before now. Um, we've been moving along quietly. Um, I just don't think we had the right branding, if I'm honest. Um, we, the beer's never changed. Um, the way we try and do things have never changed. Um, but we had a branding change at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, I did a little bit of promoting. Um, I've done videos and songs and silly things on the internet before, and um, and we've you know we've no those in the no no. Uh, but um, I don't know. I think I think with others sort of closing down, scratching their heads and everything else, it gave us a, 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 a an open window to jump through probably I think that's probably why we, we, we're known a little bit more um, during the lockdown because when every, everybody went ooh let's stop we went right no let's go make some beer and um, I think that's probably why you, you, you kind of went big didn't you mm. when as you say when other people were were closing down and, and have you seen your your reach in terms of recognition or people talking about you've seen that get much bigger De definitely definitely uh, I mean we I sort of went Right, okay, let's get our government help and we'll put it all on black. Spin the wheel. I think that's what we did. Whether that was the right decision or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, we've certainly had a lot more reach. Uh, and it's, it's continuing. It's not uh, charging like it was, uh, but the market's changed. And the market's changing by the day. Um, and it's... It's one of those, life's a gamble, business is a gamble, and um, at the moment, everything's a gamble. So, yeah. And you've told me before that sort of the beginning of lockdown kind of coincided with that change from bottles to cans as it well. It did. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, over the past three years, we've always been a, a mainly cask ale producer. Um, and back in April 17, we saw a massive change in the market. Uh, business rates changed on pubs and that really affected us and um, we we've had we moved uh, which had a bit of a change and quite a bit of investment etc etc and the market went against what we were doing we were trying to grow and the market started to shrink locally uh, you know on cask because we noticed a lot of our customers saw massive changes uh, massive increases in, in, in their rateable value um, and also uh, I noticed that the changes seem to be more punitive on independent free of tie pubs than, than tied large chain pubs. There seemed to be a much bigger change with those so it really affected our business and um, we had to start thinking 
you know, what do we do? Well, you know, so we, we tried a number of things to go big on small pack. We've, all, we've always uh, done bottles in small pack, um, you know, 500ml bottles, but very difficult to um, try and make, make yourself look different and, and market yourself on the, the standard 500ml bottle because it's seen by the public as you're a small, boring microbrewery. That's, that's, that tends to be the public perception. So we struggled with that for a while and tried to ramp that but couldn't quite get the funding that we needed because to do that properly uh, you've got to go look at this a volume game and um, as soon as you go at the volume game you need lots of money to fund it and we couldn't quite do that so last year pretty much was a bit of a loss because I just did uh, bits and bats and sort of um, lost my way for a little bit because when I started doing this um, in 2012 uh, I've been working seven days a week, 12, 18 hour days, most days, uh, brewing, driving, uh, selling, book work, marketing, design, work, everything. And um, running a bar, and for the past two years, we've run a bar single handedly, pretty much no staff, me and my wife. And um, last year it got a little bit too much, and um, I pretty much I stopped everything for two months. Um, and um, I went fishing, uh, discovered fishing again, and uh, because I needed something to sort my head out, because we, um, I was just lost, you know, lost the desire really to make beer because it was so we were finding it so hard to actually sell the stuff. We could you know, make it a great product and getting great recognition, and we'd won three star great taste awards or, and all sorts of things. World Brewing Cham um, World Heritage Malt Brewing Award with Govinda etc 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 so um, you know, last year was a, a big challenge and um, I sort of like I lost I lost the desire uh, and then back in December of last year um, I started to pull myself together and look at things and uh, we had an opportunity to uh, bring uh, a brewer into the business uh, so we brought Matt Jones in in January this year um, so I decided that I would I would use a credit facility um, available to me and that gave me enough to pay a wage two months and put um, some beer in a can and a bit of a buffer to do a little bit more once we'd done the, the test run. So we did the test run with Gibraltar Porter, a uh, bit of an odd beer to choose to put into a can, uh, Heritage Porter um, in a modern package using heritage malts and, and what have you and what have you and I was thinking well because I, I wasn't really sold on canning if I'm honest I was very anti-can and um, I thought well if I'm going to do it well, well let's do let's go in the deep end and because this will never sell and and and, and it did <laughs> uh, quite, quite it, it shocked me um, and, and I, I noticed very quickly that the 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 craft you know drinkers perception of the beer completely changed the way they looked at it so it, that, that really instilled that marketing and and product presentation is key to everything and and um, I mean I still believe that you can have the nicest looking product in the world if it doesn't taste very good you know they're not, you're not going to sell it so you need to have the whole package right so um, we pushed and um, we we got that beer brewed and packaged and then planned to do another 5,000 litres in small pack to carry on and that was due to be uh, first uh, yeah, end of March to be picked up and, um, and, and, and then packaged and, and sort of like first, second of April we were going to get the beer you know, out to the market. Um, Everything was in place, everything was about to go, everything was getting put into Arlington's and we went into lockdown and it was like, oh Christ, what are we going to do here? <laughs> and I'm going, right, can we do this, can we not do this? We got just enough money in the bank to pay for the packaging and not a lot else. Uh, and it was, do we do this or do we not do this? And um, a couple of sleepless nights and thought, well, if we're going to go bankrupt, let's do it properly. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> we uh, so we sent the beer away and um, came back, advertised, hit the shelves, did a bit of you know my usual Shane shanty type things, and um, and it just flew out the door at a speed I've never seen, and um, and I thought wow this is um you know so we just we we we've carried on producing and, and, and packaging and and have seen volumes increase and 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 go beyond anything that we've ever seen all 90 percent of it plus direct retail uh, you know, home deliveries people coming in, uh, to the brewery and, and um collecting and online uh, mail order we're sending stuff all over the place and, and still are and um, and just you know gone from there and, and, and actually thought wow the business can work so tell me about how you started this place you kind of built it didn't you what's your background how did you end up building a brewery so um i i grew up in a pub so when i was six we moved into a, a pub in macclesfield which is next town down and then we moved to a country pub halfway between macclesfield and Concord, about three miles away from here and i spent my teenage years from the age of nine to 16 uh, living in a pub um, so uh, the first pub was a Robinson's pub. Um, all the beer there was, came in barrels, so 163 litres, big things. They were, all, they, were, they were all wood. And I could remember them going down the cellar. I can remember your dad trying to get them on the stillage, two great big beams, and venting them, and beer flying everywhere, and pops coming out the top, and all over the cellar ceiling. And um, the second pub that we moved in, nine to sixteen that was the marsden's pub that was the same all oak casks barrels we were selling five and six barrels a week of beer every week uh, back in the 80s and we were busy places and we, we you know i met a lot of people and 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 had a colorful teenage year through seeing all and conversing with all these people and um that instilled a real love for beer in me uh, because it was not just the liquid and you know drinking and you know I'm not um, I, I, I love beer I really do love beer uh, in more ways than you know not, not just drinking it I, I, I love the whole history of it uh, how it's made what it is I mean it's a, it's a, it's one of the most agricultural products that you can, that we've got it's, it's, as, it's as important as bread as far as I'm concerned at 16 I uh, became an engineer and, um, and I, I, I had several engineering jobs, maintenance, what have you um, and about 14 years ago, 15 years ago I, um, I got a phone call from Molson Coors in Burton on Trent and um, would have been interested in um, going to look at uh, a job as a maintenance engineer uh, at the Burton Brewery so I'd been recently working in um, high-speed labelling machines and building um, all sorts of packaging machines. Um, so yeah, I can go and do that, thinking, oh, I'll end up on a canning line and, and what have you. Um, went for a couple of interviews, had a trade test, got offered a job. Uh, I went to work at Molson Coors Burton Brewery and got put into the brew house. And there were pumps there the size of your shed there was um, 500 barrel brew, you know, uh, brewing vessels, etc., etc. Never worked on a pump in my life, and I'm looking at this place, going, "What have I done?" And um, I um, was stuck in this massive brewery with um, two mash filter plates, uh, plate filters, which would be I don't know, big as about six sheds in a row. Um, 500 barrel brew plants, uh, huge pumps, etc. etc. I'm just thinking, how am I going to work on this lot? And uh, I soon learned very quickly that I could be the best maintenance engineer in the world if I didn't know anything about brewing. I wasn't going to go. I wasn't going to last very long in this place. Um, so, as well as um, 
working out how to be, how to navigate around um, something the size of a small town um, and you, know, you get a call from somewhere and somebody say there's something a pumps or a sensor's broken bibbies and you're like oh where's bibbies and oh well, that's this room here there and everywhere and you know up 12 flights of stairs and through three blocks of disused plant and there's, a, there's a, a room in the middle that works as well as doing all that um, I had to learn about brewing beer again and I brewed beer when I was 18 19 uh, so I've done boots kits Guinness Krona lager you know Mexican lager um, bitters all sorts of things biles uh, all bloody awful and um, they were what they were they got you drunk but they weren't fantastically home products but I did all that um, but when I worked at Coors I was like right how how do I get somewhere with this lot so I um, yeah you know, I, I, I decided to get a, um, a cool box and a plastic bucket uh, with a heating element in and all the other stuff and started to brew beer all grain and uh, got the Graham Wheeler book and uh, Dave Lyons book and what most home brewers do and started to make beer and um, some of it was good some of it was, wasn't so good some of it was you know, scratching your head uh, tried to bottle stuff was terrible at bottling beer could, I, could, I, could, and, and I could make a great beer stick it in a bottle infect it and um, made lots of mistakes and, and, and tried all sorts of things and um, I used to take stuff into into work, speak to lots of heritage, what train brewers, what do you think of this, what were you trying to do, and they, oh right, try this, try that, try the other, started to read and read and read and learn, and, and then I joined uh, the Northern Craft Brewers, which I think are still, well they are still going, they're, they're a group of home brewers based in Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cheshire, Manchester area, um, and basically over a number of years working at Coors, um, I learnt to brew and learnt to brew pretty good. Um, and you know, people would I'd give people beer and they said, oh, "You should do this for a living. You're good at it." And whatever. And anyway, the um, I worked at Coors from I came off the tools, went, worked in planning at Coors for three years, and then uh, came to a point where. The job I was seconded in, I had to make a choice of whether to go back on the tools, go back on the shifts, or whether to stay in that job. So I, I decided to leave and went to work in the paper industry. And that was the worst choice I'd ever made in my life, I think, and I hated it every minute of it. I used to sit in my car in the morning with my head in my hands going, oh, what am I doing? And um, I decided I needed to get back into beer. So we set up a brewery and um, we. Um, I spent lots of time on eBay and websites and all over looking for second hand tanks and thought right we can build something in the spare time and, and what have you and, and I filled all the side of my house up with tanks, with dairy tanks, with um, Grundy tanks, all sorts of pumps in my garage and everything, everywhere I was filled. Um, made myself really popular because my wife could struggle to get into the back garden and stuff through stuff everywhere because we were storing it looking for somewhere as a unit to you know to put the stuff in um, and in um, April 2012 found a unit around the corner um, next to hit this unit five and we moved in there on uh, May the 18th 2012 um, blank canvas went in uh, had to put drains to the floors put the electrics on the wall build the tanks so basically it was a workshop for a, for a couple of months uh, where I built a mash tun so I built a, a five barrels a rectangular mash tun which is still brewing beer to this day as far as I'm aware it's up at Blackjack in Manchester all their beers are made on the mash tun I made um, I made a, a copper was made out of a conical uh, so we had a five barrel conical as a copper uh, which was very unconventional but it made great beer it worked really well uh, it was a real pig to clean the elements in it but apart from that it, it worked really well um, we used a couple of Grundy tanks as fermenters um, cellar coolers to cool those real higgledy piggledy um, setup but it worked and um, I made beer on that for about three months 
and still did the job in the paper mill uh, and then got to the point built trade up enough where I said right okay um, I think we can do this for a full time now and um, and gave up the job and um, and then we've been doing this ever since so it's um, yeah <laughs> bit of a long way around but we got there About the heritage beers, what? Tell me about what's special about them. What? What? You know, you said you right, you okay. love everything about beer, and you know, tell well, me about that. Well, I grew up on, as like I say, I grew up on bitter that came out of wooden casks and big barrels. You know, not these toy town firkins that we use nowadays. Um, but beer could be served in barrels, and you could sell a barrel in three days because people were drinking volume, um, and that's not the case now but that from being a little boy watching my dad you know sit something for two or three days let it settle and then it in you know he had a, he had a um, I think it was a valve actually out of an engine stainless steel valve or which he had and that's what he used to knock through the top and I'm watching this beer fly out the top and watching the, the, the hops coming out and and literally give him a shower some days a new shirt on and him shouting because he's got going to get changed and 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 that smell and and you know and and and, and everything about it and and you know that you'd, you'd watch it coming out of the hample and the, you know the beer running down the side and the guys picking it up and it was like they'd just come from work and they just come in and they got the first beer of the night and it was just like watching their eyes and watching their face like oh you know, and and all you know really good traditional english bitter really consistent really good quality and um you know I, I, that to me is beer you know really you know 4.2 4.0 up to five percent um you know chestnut english bitter it's, it's the pinnacle and and that's what you know pubs should be serving and, and celebrating and, and and that's what people i think you know we should be drinking in the main in, in pubs not something with mangoes and, and, and whatever coming out of it there's a place for those beers and, and, and but it's not a beer um, you know if you go to Germany and they love their brewing tradition and you go in the pubs all over and they're all serving what's local and, and what's there we don't do that anymore and we've got great ingredients and we've got a heritage of fantastic beers and when I was within the Northern Craft Brewers, we had a competition for English IPA, and um, and people brought these beers in bottles, and and some of them were just I've never had anything as good since, you know, um, but they were a complete and utter shock to the system, because they weren't what I expected IPA to be, because they you drank them and they lit your tongue up with bitterness, they were that bitter and it was just there was, there was almost a fizz to them and it was like what is this you know never had beer like this what is it you know and they were going oh well you know it's the, uh, some of the people that were in the group were national guild of beer and wine judges judges and and very very knowledgeable people on beer and and you know and what some were bjcp and and but you know some of them been some of these people had brewed since the early 70s um you know and, and were, were helping writing the books on home brewing and, and what have you but these beers were just phenomenal and and i thought right i need to look at this more so i used to drink white shield and think that was you know fantastic and oh it's a great beer now but it's it's not a proper it's a watered down english ipa um and but i just think that those types of beers need to be looked at and researched and and, and people try to recreate them so i back then when I was home brewing um, I found the Durden Park beer circle book I had a look through it found a Burton style uh, pale ale um, recreated it pretty, pretty much what Govinda is um, looked at um, you know what did they do in Burton on Trent at the time so uh, long mash, you know, stiff mash um, long time in the mash tun long sparge 
and a long burnt and simmer so like a three hour boil um, but only only a, a slight rolling simmer because they couldn't get the vigorous boil so you know that, that, that's the ethos behind that beer and we made it with um, pale malt to start off with I've made it a few times as a ho- at home brewing level and thought it was really, you know, really good flavour some beer greater than some of its parts and then when we started to um, brew in the brewery commercially I, I said right what we'll do we'll do Govinda as a celebration of hitting so many brews so we'll do it at 50 brews we'll do it at 100 and, and what so originally that's what we did and we brewed it with um so pale malt the first time maris otter the second time floor malted maris otter and and that was better and then um we were going to do another ver- we did a barrel aged version of it so uh, we aged it in some uh, casks which had been wine casks some that had been we thought they were wine casks it turned out they'd, they'd been brandy casks and it was like what do we do with these um so anyway, so we did different ones. We did um, you know two dip two versions there and, and what have you. And then I went to a seminar over in Leeds uh, at the Tetley Building uh, that Chris Maltins were um, doing at the time, um, and um, they mentioned that they they were uh, they'd got this program going with the John In In Centre. Dr Chris read out, and they were um, Dr Chris was and his team as part of a, a student's PhD studies. They were regrowing Chevalier, which was a heritage variety of barley uh, that had been grown in the 1800s, and um, most of it had gone to the States, uh, or was going to the States, and they were looking for somebody in the UK to make uh, some beer with it, um, to test it out, uh, and it would be fantastic for making um, you know, East India Port or Imperial Stout or, a, or an, an English IPA, and, um, and I just went, he has pricked up um, that guy and uh, I said so uh, uh, in the seminar I said right I want that malt and I've got just the right it's just the right amount that I need um, I've just been to the White Rose Cooperage because I had I'd just been up to see Alistair up at the White Rose Cooperage um, that morning at 6am in the morning then drove down to Leeds for the, the seminar at 8am because uh, I'd got some oak barrels in the back of the van to, to age the beer on uh, I said I want that barley um, we're going to brew this beer this is what it is etc etc we're going to barrel age it and then i'll release it and i'll make the best from your barley and they were sort of like oh, we're not so sure about that yeah because they didn't really know me from adam or really or anything and i've been using them for about nine months or, or what have you and um anyway um i left and um like um, they say in vic reeves you wouldn't let it lie <laughs> I wouldn't let it lie. I, uh, I got on the phone the next day and um, asked to speak to the, the head honcho and spoke to Ewan McPherson down at Chris Maltin's and gave him the story and uh, and by the end of the conversation it was right Shane what day of the week do you want it delivery so um, we'll, we'll bring we'll send it to you next week and I was like okay fantastic um, managed to get the barley uh, and then in the meantime uh, I'd heard that Martin down at Poppylon Brewery had done um, a very small brewery using Chevalier barley. He'd got some off uh, Dr. Chris Red out and he'd brewed 50 litres or something like that and made a beer called uh, Days of Empire, uh, which is an English IPA, 6.8%, uh, hop with hedgerow hops, etc, etc, etc. So I hunted and hunted because I think there was only about 50 bottles, or 50, 60 bottles, and I found one. Um, maybe on the beers of Europe anyway I, I found a bottle of it uh, £28.50 I think it was and at the time for a 250ml bottle it was a lot of money uh, but I thought I've got to have it because I need to know what this barley tastes like I've been told it's not going to ferment out as much as others it's going to have a lot more body it's going to be a bit more challenging so um, I'm buying the bottle opening it drinking it and um, it, it it stopped me in my tracks for a few minutes because it was completely not what I was expecting at all. Uh, I was expecting something which, which was going to be very, very bitter uh, because of what I was used to tasting through the, the Northern Craft Brewers, etc. Uh, you know, their, their, their English IPAs, and, and it was far from it. It was, it was, it was very much like a bottle of J.W. Lee's Harvest. So it tasted at six point eight percent. It was like an aged 
barley wine, really sweet, really cloying, um, really full of flavour, not hot flavour though. And um, and it made me think, oh, hang on a minute, this, this beer needs a lot more hops, it's not, it's quite unbalanced, it's, 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 it's far too malty. So it made me stop and um, I read as much as I could through different historians on old beers and, and tried to find books in bookshops and, and what have you to try and find out as much information as I could on the production and what have you of old beers and, and I'd looked at the recipe for the Grinder and um, obviously I've renamed it Grinder but um, and I was looking at all the the thinking um, about you know East India Pale Ales were highly hopped uh, in order to um, you know, give them bacterial guard to guard them on their on their trip to India and all that that's the thing that's cobblers if I'm honest um, I I personally think from brewing with Chevalier Barley on several occasions and from the hop levels that we use in it uh, that back then uh, they didn't have the science that we've got now they didn't know what the alphas of the, bar the hops were uh, there is the thing that they did tend to use end of season hops so they may have oxidized a bit more than others they may not have, have had the alpha acids um, the fresh hops that we get now because hops are, are, are stored much better now than they used to be um, but i think they were so highly hopped because you needed that alpha level that bitterness to balance the beer out and um, because those barleys were much sweeter and much more full of flavoured you needed f a phenomenal amount of hops to, to dry them out to balance them out to, to, to give them that that drinkability and that um, you know that crispness that they've got because I think Govinda on its day um, and it does vary a little bit um, you know here and there because you know the, the, the hops do vary a little bit um, and and the barley, I think, from the first time we brewed it, it was floor malted, and now it's 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 um, malted in in the, the mechanical maltings. Um, I think it's 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 you know, so it's modified a little bit better now, and um, you tend to get a drier product. It, it, it it's it's to me it, it's it's. I sent some away to, to I've sent some away to, to several journalists and, and beer writers and uh, uh, bloggers and all sorts of things and one of the best comments I had was from Martin at the Beer Clock Show and um, they opened it and tried it and were like wow if beer tasted like this in Victorian times what went wrong and 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 that I think that describes probably why I'm interested in heritage products because it's if beers did taste like that in the 1800s, why are we where we are now? You know, you said that you love beer not just for the taste and not just for the um you know uh, making it but but for what it represents and for what it says about us what what kind of heritage beer teach us about well beer is a social lubricant isn't it and it's also um it's what everybody goes on about great britain and, and you know a lot of the things about great britain aren't so great oh let's be honest it's a lot of it's based around um taking over the taking over the world and 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 herding people and and making them work long hours for nothing and um maybe maybe beer isn't so great when you think about um how it kept out how it lubricated the, the cogs and kept all that all that moving but um it's part of our history it's part of our fabric it's, it's what knits us as people together um you know the coal mines the steelworks and and all that 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 brought us to where we are today would have never have happened without something like beer because and and you know it, it, you read the stories and, and look at the history and and uh, you know there's um 
I quite like the folk ballads that were on the BBC. There's a number of them. There's some in the 50s, um, and there's been some modern ones since. Uh, and there's, there's, there's one on Sheffield, which is it's well worth listening to. Uh, there's a great song on it with uh, Kate Rusby uh, about I must wash, wash my curtains, where um, a woman has just been told her husband's died in the steelworks, and, and her first thought is, I must wash my curtains. And, and the story around it was that on Attercliffe Road, the, the sulphur was that bad in the air from the steelworks that it yellowed the net curtains on a daily basis and they used to wash the curtains on a daily basis and to make them, you know, it was one of the most polluted areas in the UK and terrible working conditions, etc, etc. But there's also the stories of, you know, in that area when all that was going on, that the local pub, they'd be filling a wheelbarrow full of pints of 3.6% working man's bitter and then that was taken into the steelworks and they were necking that in between what have you and it allowed those men to to deal with the the horrors of you know of daily work and you know the coal mining areas are the same steelworks and all, all the areas where we had massive rises of industry all had that's where the breweries grew and that's where you know that 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 blue that that product that, that beer was it was part of day-to-day -day life and it was part of it, it it knitted everybody together and and you know we we saw great communities and you know and and and, and people working together on probably the largest you know some of the largest scales we'll ever see and a lot of that was 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 revolved around beer